Hi, my name is Chris Feed Amazing, and I'm one of the 2020 New York City artists in residence at Residency Unlimited. I'm going to walk through my body of work and quickly explain what I'm kind of building and working on during this residency. I was born on Long Island, New York, and I'm a first generation American person who studied in New York City and has been in New York City for a very long time. So I will start with my first body of work, um, not my first, but the body of work that kind of pivoted a lot of my direction in terms of my general um, practice, which is called Tapa Tapa. Tapa Tapa is actually the name of a song, a dance hall song that celebrates like a, the baddest girl in the clique or the leader or being leaders. Essentially, I want to create images that lifted up people who I'd heard been heard through global news had been killed or murdered who are queer. As a queer person myself, um, I made this work five, about five years ago um, and kept hearing about these tragedies that were happening in Jamaica. I had no idea what was really happening on the island other than the, a lot of these um, horrible new things that would break into the news. So I took the names of these people and created pieces as um, paying homage to them. So Dean Monroe, who's actually seen in this photograph here on the table, this is a picture of me. Um, Dwayne is another person who was killed, Dwayne A. Jones. And as you can see, I used and referenced um, classic paintings, obviously Death of Marat in this piece to kind of bring some pride and celebration to these people, even though they had passed. Their deaths ironically um, push forward and continue to push forward the queer liberation that's happening in Jamaica. So again, Leonard Steve Harvey, as you can see here. And so these images were important to me and kind of pivoted my work in terms of, in terms of looking at my heritage for um, a source of inspiration and kind of the very nuanced but complicated relationship between queerness, gender, race, and being Jamaican and or Caribbean. Around this time, I or after this project, I created a um, network, an art network of people um, called Raga MIC. And essentially this was a project and is a project that focuses on lifting up queer Caribbean people, where that be through events or online storytelling um, and with different people from different backgrounds in the art, whether that be fashion, poetry, or visual art etc. Um, with this I created a handful of parties so there are tons of fun. Sorry that it's loading still and it was I've done them in Toronto, New York City, um, all over and so that's good times and then aside from that I also created um, a series of online storytelling through interviews of these people who I included into this essentially queer family um, of queer Caribbean people to learn more from them about their experience being queer or being Trinidadian or from Barbados or Jamaican or wherever they stem from or Puerto Rico. So that was a lot of this work in terms of um, bringing kind of a better understanding to me about what was happening in my community and what were the stories that could inspire me and or give me some direction to do with my own family. Um, for example, this is, um, this, this is an amazing artist who I've worked with, Dominique. Sorry for the loading issues. And she lives in LA and she stems from Puerto Rico and all the Reiki healings and work that she does um, with healing um, and spirituality have been just an example of some of the people who I've contacted and worked with. So again, doing interviews with them, them explaining their craft and how it relates to their heritage and then doing photo shows with them where I pull on a photographer to make that all happen. So in turn, that has filled back into my work because with these people from Raga, I've been able to create installations like Nest. And Nest essentially is a reaction to the Hurricane Maria um, tragedy that happened in Puerto Rico. And with this, I created an installation with Uptown Lewis and Antonio Perez, two members of the Raga family, where we paid homage again to Puerto Rico and raised funds in the room with photography, live drawing, as you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, live drawing, as you can see, we shot a documentary talking about the relationship between the mainland and Puerto Rico and 
kind of just really creating a nuance for healing and conversation, which has um, been a really important part of my art practice. So I've been able to make images, um, build communities of people, as you can see here, um, and also create installations and performative things like that. With all this knowledge that I built from talking to people in the Raga family, I then got the opportunity to do a residency at new, the New Museum. And with this opportunity, I delved more into these interviews with these individuals in this community that I, in this family that I had built. And one in particular conversation I had with a friend of mine who is queer and Caribbean, she's Haitian, Caroline Lazard, spoke to me about the nuances and the beauty that voodoo actually has in a, in a spirituality in of itself, being African, and how it's not binary. Um, and that, I thought that was inspirational and, and amazing, and how innately, because there's no binary, there's innately then in turn no hard lines about homophobia or where gender lies um, in relationship to the spirituality. And I just thought about that a lot when making this body of work about spirituality and how important it is and has been for people of color to liberate themselves, find freedom, find peace. Um, and so I created these, recreated these moments throughout history that kind of like showcased this um, resilience, specifically this one image and another image um, focused on Bayou Kamen, which essentially was the Vodo ceremony that took place before the Haitian Revolution. So all the people in this image are members of the Raga family. This is me here in the corner with the bald head. And really recreating these images where Black people were triumphant, even in bleak history and bleak times, and replacing those people with only queer people and allies of the queer community. So really placing us in history and finding moments where women or queer people really led change in the Caribbean diaspora. Um, another image to kind of jump into really quickly was this image with me and a friend of mine, Corey's. Um, in some of my research, I found specifically to Jamaica, an individual named William Thomas Beckford, who was a queer man who lived in London, who was British and escaped London because he was found being sexual and he had to run for his life or they were gonna hang him. And ironically enough, he came to Jamaica and ended up being the largest slave plant plantation owner in the States. So stories like that kind of really brought nuance and made me think a lot more about just how complicated the history of queerness and gender and race as it relates to col colonial and post-colonial times in the Caribbean um, that I thought were important to kind of bring up and kind of, again, always highlight these beautiful and amazing queer black and brown people that kind of don't have their own set part of the library per se, but would definitely have always been here and have survived through it. Um, another image of the voodoo ceremony. So again, another version of that kind of really bringing strength to these people. And with these images, I built the set with a florist of mine. So all this is real flowers. All these costumes have been created for this shoot. Like I worked with my brother, Kenny Demezi, hi Kenny, who um, worked with me to tailor all the things you see in these images, this dress, this dress, this dress. So really engaging and working with the community to um, build images that were meant to speak to pride and power in the face of so much danger. This image is about Queen Nanny, and as for lack of a better term, she was the Harriet Tubman of Jamaica of her time. Um, she was a leader. She freed a bunch of um, free slaves that went into the Blue Mountains of Jamaica. So really these moments of pride and power in the Caribbean diaspora. Then moving forward from there, I created a body of work called On the Palm Tree Leaves. I finally indeed went to Jamaica and met a bunch of queer people there. I had been since I was a child and it opened up my eyes to speak to people on the land and kind of get a better picture of what the liberation and struggles where our queer people are in Jamaica, again, because I'm Jamaican. Um, and to, to my knowledge and surprise, a lot of it had to do indeed with the suspected, uh, easily, easily could be suspected um, issues of post-colonialism and the fact that it was a third world country and, through issues like um, economic stress and how that affected the social dynamics, everything from there. So learning more about the issues of the IMF deal, which you all can Google separately, um, International Monetary Fund, 
and the World Bank and how the organizations like that, which are heavily funded by European, European nations and America, have gone into black and brown countries and belittled and kind of like economic, have put these countries in, in economic deals that have led them to be um, in, essentially in an economic slavery um, and to have tons of debt and they can't use their own land in certain cases, their dollars lowered, all to just sustain. Um, instead of being allies with them and to working with them and trading with them to build their economy, they've placed them in a secondary um, class system in terms of economics. So with issues like that, of course, it's going to bleed out to every part of the history and um, post-colonial um, working to be free and be self-sustaining um, understanding of what it is for these small countries, again, like Jamaica, where my mother is from and where my family is from. So I wanted to create images that showcase to pull back from the camera and kind of weren't as sleek and sexy, beautiful moments as these were and really switch it up and make images that kind of pull back from the camera and showcase the nuance of how complicated these histories actually were and that it wasn't just as black and white as it's dangerous in these places for gay people. And that's all we know. There's a lot happening on the ground, and in turn, there are really great, amazing organizations and tons and tons of queer people in Jamaica and throughout the Caribbean making changes, finding each other, um, lifting each other up. And if anything, they're because they're in a third world country or because they're in a country that is being held back by the um, the very bleak and insidious actions of European and American nations, they're struggling just to get by, but still in, in that struggle, having resilience to find each other under the palm tree leaves, for lack of a better term. And so with these pieces in terms of the making of them, I created these images that kind of show this warmth and this love and this kind of like brightness of these people holding each other and being together. But with the images themselves, with the prints themselves, I wanted to start to end into a more tactile way of working with the images. So I paint it on top of them and start to add sand to the edges of them um, to kind of bring in two, three dimensions to, 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 to continue to show the nuance of this history and these issues that they weren't very black and white. Um, at least from what I had seen from the, my early body of work where I just was hearing about what's happening in Jamaica versus actually being there. Um, and it, having growing an empathy for these people and also becoming less ignorant about my ideas of what the world looked like outside of my world and especially being more in tune with like my privilege of even as being a queer person who lives in the States. Um, so that's this body of work in short, kind of. And the most recent body of work, Yard, started with an interview that I had with my mother about two years ago where after going to Jamaica and her um, being very worried, very concerned about me being there, me having an interest about what her, other than just being a black mother and being concerned, which is makes complete sense, what her relationship to Jamaica was and what her history was there. Um, I'd gone there on a trip, on a connect trip. So essentially as a sidebar, I'm also the co-founder and, and, um, it's an extension of the Raga family that I do a project called Connect JA. And essentially what this is, is a project where I, every year, um, I link up with a bunch of people here in the States and around the globe to take a yearly trip to Jamaica to experience queer Jamaica. Safe, together, and really a moment for us to celebrate. Go out dancing, go to beach days, you know, go hiking, have family dinners, do panels, and really to enjoy each other with all queer staff, um, lodging, bus drivers, musicians, DJs, chefs, everyone involved is queer and or an ally. And this has been another huge part of my work for, in terms of like, what am I doing with, with, with acknowledging and kind of finding out more about all these hardships happening in, in the Caribbean and the history and how the nuances work is really then creating a new chapter where queer people are empowered to change that history um, and me being blessed enough to be a part of that but really working with people on the ground um, daily, weekly, <laughs> aggressively to make that happen. We already did one trip that was in 2019 um, per COVID. This has been on pause and it's going to actually happen hopefully at the end of this year in 2020 but it was really beautiful, really great and a part of I would say a part of my work in terms of the 
community building. Fast forward back to my other work. Um, after on the Connect trip, I had a very anxious, stressed out mom back in New York City. So when I came back to New York City, I interviewed her to ask her about what her relationship was to Jamaica. And she, in a string of stories, told me that she actually didn't fear Jamaica and she actually missed it and loved it and had really beautiful memories of it. And if anything, was kind of like still not letting go of the trauma that she experienced as a child there. And in a string of stories, in short, she, from between my research of looking at the history of Jamaica, um, when she was a teenager, a preteen, pre and what, was, what she was telling me about, she experienced an, and was in Jamaica during an economic collapse. And with a country with so little resources, an economic collapse, you know, is more intense than it would be in, say, per America. Um, it's already a country trying to survive. So she, you know, like I always said to people, ghettos don't just become ghettos. They become ghettos because of over policing, they become ghettos because of economic um, disaster and or stifling. They become ghettos because of lack of resources and um, usually unfortunately government, you know, involvement in all those things. So my mom was in Jamaica when there was economic crash and she went from having beautiful memories of running by the lake and being free to being um, essentially orphaned because her grandmother died and then her mother had to move to the States to make ends meet to send back to her kids. And so she was motherless and had no parent around for a handful of years, which is where the narrative and the trauma stems from. That has stemmed all the way into my life per se, because I grew up thinking like, oh, there's this beautiful island I visited sometimes, but never really go there. Um, so this body of work, really is more personal and looking taking all the tactics that i've looked into researching and talking to people and like looking into history into my own family and oral history within my family and my family history and my relationship to the fear of home um and the fear of kind of like my people yard means home in jamaica patwa so i wanted to make this body of work to kind of like visualize that journey of talking with my mom, having afraid of Jamaica, coming so far as to build roots in Jamaica with other queer people there, and kind of make these dreamlike images that kind of like encapsulated these nightmares or these dreams that we were having as a family within our bodies, within our spirits. Um, and I'm just gonna quickly go through them. Those are the four of them. So as you can see, the physical of these pieces also very much developed and changed per my previous work. In terms of the, which I'll get to in a second, but in terms of the images, for example, I use, I'll chat only my family and myself. And this image specifically is my mom dressed up in garment that she would wear often to practice her spiritual practices to find solace, even when she was in Jamaica. So really kind of bringing um, more context on my own family story into these images. Duppy is a word for ghost or specter in Jamaica and Patwa. So the idea of that there were bodies of energy and histories and stories that were have always been in my family and in the room with us that we haven't been discussing, but we're still traumatizing us or it's like making a place that we didn't know was there. Um, kind of like really visualizing that and thinking about my ancestors and just within my family, not just in the history of the Caribbean at large, but like my great, great grandfather or my great, great grandmother and what they had to go through and what they dealt with. And more immediately, my mother um, and my grandmother being again in Jamaica where there's an economic crash. And so a group, you know, of my mother and all her sisters are now you know, placed in a situation where they maybe feel danger, whether that be through some story she told me about keeping toms or feeling in danger from men who are tried to rob her or things like that. So we're not really having a dark and bleak idea of Jamaica at large, but in terms of her specific relationship and the things she experienced there, her image or impression of Jamaica being stained. So kind of this fear that she needed to unroot from herself or that I needed to unroot from myself and we, that we did as a family just through conversation, as you can see something like this, to kind of like rebirth a new relationship to our, to our um, ourselves, our people, our heritage, and our, indeed our home, our yard. Um, so with this work, in terms of the physical element, I wanted to not just shoot images and print them, but continue to grow on the physical elements that, I, that you had seen in Under the Palm Tree Leaves. 
And I printed on canvas and then extended the canvas on the edges and then dipped them into a huge pool of resin and really warped and worked with the material to kind of put my physical frustrations or concerns or pain or even hope into the physical elements of these pieces so that I could um, kind of put it into the piece and then leave it there. Um, so that they were indeed these warped kind of capsules of my feelings and the and like pain that my family had gone through into these pieces, but also indeed hope. Um, you know, it's through this process of interviewing and making physical pieces for me and talking to my family and shooting my family and shooting myself that I was able to come on the other end of all this and find a better relationship even just to my mom and better understanding of just like all the work I'm making in general because it's a lot more personal and it's a lot more physical. Um, and so the pieces have sand, dirt, vines from Jamaica itself that I put into my luggage don't tell anybody, <laughs> and put into the pieces on the sides of them. And then also notes from a woman that I met in Jamaica who gave me a lot of the life affirmations and just in relationship to staying strong. And she actually recommended I do go talk to my mom and that I shouldn't be so afraid. And really, and that feeling all in there. So what I plan to do with all, and then and the last bit of work that I'll share is that I created an installation um, and performance piece with my mother called Altar, where essentially we recreated an altar like she would, like the ones she would produce and make when I was growing up in our house in Long Island. And I spoke to her in a series of conversations again about what she did to heal while she was in Jamaica as a child and here, here in New York as an adult, and kind of like learning from what her practice was to then recreate that space and that healing kind of like um, energy to kind of move forward from just the trauma that we talked about. And in the background, you can see that I, create, I created a kind of like this like colorful, um, plastic jungle background, essentially for lack of a better term, to also then shoot in and place, act as a base for this altar to sit within. So with all that said, I'm for the residency going to be continuing to research and interview my family and then make works that kind of continue to push into this oral story with women in my family and get a better understanding of how I can continue to push myself with the physical elements. Given COVID, it's been pretty tough, to say the least, to physically be in my studio and obviously be around other people, but I am excited to continue to get a bunch of feedback with all the studio visits I'm having and continue to think about how I can visualize this oral story from within, from within my family and yeah, learn and grow. And that's all I got. Thank you so much.